You don't have. We are live and recording. Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. We have a very awesome event. I don't even really need to give these authors an introduction because you know who they are. But we have Robin the Fevers, and we might be here to celebrate her really, really, really awesome new book. And then we also have Stephanie Garber here as well. I am going to go ahead and let them take it away. You're in phenomenal hands. We have fun things coming up. We even have potential quizzes and whatnot headed your way. Make sure if you have questions, there's a beautiful ask a question button down below. Hit that. And if you have questions, type them out. And also, I am so excited, but we get to offer you guys signed books. That's right. So for Igniting Darkness, we have signed copies, which I am beyond excited to get to offer you guys. So, yep, I will stop rambling, and Stephanie and Robin, I will let you take it away. Oh. Oh, thank you for the lovely introduction, Constance. I, so sweet. I am so excited um, to be here celebrating Robin's latest book. Um, I am just a fangirl for a moment because I'm a huge fan of Robin. Um, I still remember the first time I read one of her books, I found it in a bookstore in Sonoma and it was Grave Mercy, which is the first book in um, the His Fair Assassin trilogy. And I just sat there and read for like a good 25 minutes because I couldn't put it down. Um, I love her books. I love Robin. Um, Robin is also the author of, is it 12 middle grade books? 13 middle grade books. Yeah. Okay. Middle grade books. She's a New York Times bestseller, and um, she has one of my favorite Instagram accounts. I love Robin's Instagram. I um, I'm gonna sound so nerdy, but whatever. I think we all know I'm a nerd. Um, I have actually like printed out some of her like writing, um, writing sheets that she's put up on her Instagram. She has so much good tips for writers. So she's really generous. Author, and I'm so excited to talk with her today. <laughs> awesome. um, that was, that's like the best introduction I've ever had, ever, I think. <laughs> Certainly the most enthusiastic. Um, I'm going to introduce you for a minute because in case people don't know who you are, although I'm guessing that they do, because you kind of burst onto the scene here about, what, was it four, four years ago now? With, with, the, with Caravel? Almost. It's three and a half years. I mean, you burst onto the scene, and that book just took the YA world by storm. And it's been followed up by three amazing books, Legend and Finale. And boy, talk about imaginations. Um, I have been so impressed by yours. But you guys, more than being a great writer and more than being having a phenomenal imagination, Stephanie is one of those rare unicorns of a people, of a person that is just the nicest, most enthusiastic, most kindest person ever. So if you ever get to be around Stephanie, take the opportunity because it's really like a gift to yourself. So thank you for being here, Stephanie. I can't think of anybody more exciting to be sharing this launch with. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, and we really are so excited to be here. Robin and I have chatted a lot about today. And we, um, I have to like, I keep, when I look to the side, it's because I have my like list. Because I <laughs> to type everything up, even though I know what we're doing. Um, we are doing, we're going to have games because we both love games and Robin wanted, Robin's so generous that she wanted to give away some prizes. prizes. So the games are very simple um, and they're also just a fun way to interact since we can't see all your beautiful faces. So uh, we have three questions that we're going to ask and if you answer in the little like say something nice comment bubble. Um, we will pick winners at the end. So you have to be around at the end. So we'll let you know you won. So um, the first question is, um, we're going to be answering this question and you all have to guess what our answers are. So the question is, what is your favorite romantic trope, Robin? And so, oh wait, but we gotta give you guys the chance to guess before we answer. Also, we're gonna answer that for Stephanie as well. Guess what Stephanie's favorite romantic trope is, right? Are we doing both at the same time? Yes, yes. So, how about if you guys put guesses? Um, Robin, you want to tell us? Give us a short synopsis of Igniting Darkness, which I know your favorite thing to do. It's short synopsis. <laughs> short synopsis is so painful, especially because you never know how many people have read the other book. But so. And Igniting Darkness, 
in case you don't know, it's um, set in medieval France where two assassin nuns are deep undercover in the French court. Um, the current French king is married to the former Duchess of Brittany, who is who these assassins are loyal to, and things are not going well at all. And things are going so poorly that um, Sabella has also become a target of the political factions against the queen, the new queen. And so, wow, how do I stop at this? And then there's Genevieve, poor Genevieve, who has just made the biggest mistake of her entire life, um, thinking she was doing the absolutely right thing for all the right reasons, but it turned out to be like the worst thing she would possibly have done. So she's basically just woken up to, on the next morning and realized that she's screwed up beyond measure. And it's the story of those two trying to reconcile that horrible mistake and fix things and make them better and save the queen and save themselves. And if they can help them to burn down the patriarchy while they're at it, then so much the better. I don't know how accurate that is, but that's how, I, that's how I'm describing it today. <laughs> Accuracy is the point. Accuracy. Like I always love hearing this author because so so different than how I see the book. Well, not always, but it's always interesting to see like oh, like you know what they choose to highlight. I've seen lots um, of yeah, and some people got my answer too. I am surprised somebody's been following you all along or has read all your books and knows. I I feel like I'm like was someone eavesdropping earlier? Okay, Robin, what's yours? Because a lot of people have got it. Yeah, everybody got it, and I love the I love the terms. Not just um, enemies to lovers, but yeah, enemies to lovers, or or and, um, serious serious dislike to lovers. That is one of my favorites. But when I was thinking, when I was talking to Robin earlier, I was like, my actual favorite is the dual identity, secret identity. Yes. Um, and I didn't think anyone would guess it. And so I'm really excited that some of you guys like got both of us. Yeah. That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Okay. So, um, all right. So our theme, oh my gosh, I forgot to say, we have a theme for tonight which is love and death in YA, which this might be one of my favorite themes that we've ever had, especially since it's so fitting for Robin's books because she has assassin nuns, which are the best ever. And so um, I wanna, I'm curious, Robin, why do you think like a broader question that there's so much love and death in YA? You know, I'm, I've been really struck by that. It seems over the last 10 years in particular, that's really lost like, well, basically just, right around the time that Grave Mercy came out, that seems like that was becoming more and more of a thing, that more and more books were centering around. Well, love's kind of been a constant because first love is such a big part of our teen experience. But the death seemed more and more to be playing a part, and I was pretty fascinated by that. And part of it, the writer in me thinks, well, you know, high stakes, you want to play for high stakes, but there's other ways to get high stakes. I think the reason it works so well for a theme for YA books is, if you think of it, as a teen, you're kind of in the middle of a small death, you're leaving childhood behind, and you're getting ready to become an adult. So you're kind of in this one part of your life, the comfortable and familiar part is dying, and then your new self is being born. So I think there's that, there's a, on some level we're aware there's a finality to the transition we're in. Does that make sense? It, you know, it totally does. I've never thought of it like that before, but I feel like you know, when you think of being younger, at least for me, like I didn't realize, you know, when you when you leave high school, like and I moved away to college and didn't come back for a long time. And so there were people who it's like you never realize you're never going to see again. Right. And you right. don't know. And it almost is like there's, you know, right. they're not dead. You never see them. You never hear from them. It is the and it's the end and i think on some level we know that especially all those senior events it's like it's there's we're so aware that like we might not ever see these people again and they've been such a big part of our lives for so long so yeah i think that's i think it's it's very relevant to um what we're feeling and i think it's fun to write <laughs> like, it is not always. Sometimes I'm like, why did I do that? That was a real bad choice because now my characters are going to be sad. But um, there's something fun about writing it. <laughs> well, there is. And, and, and part of it, too, is 
I mean, I think I had to make a choice when I started writing about assassin nuns and they doing it for YA, it would have been really easy to shy away from the killing part and only um, like have them talk about killing or have them kill off screen. And I, but I didn't want to do that. I, it, it's like, if you're going to have an assassin, they need to be actually killing. And one of the reasons for having to be assassin nuns was so it could include the full gamut of killing, um, the full gamut of the experiences of death. So, and I think part of that was, so I kind of get out from tangent here, but part of that was because I think as a society, we focus very, we see death very, very narrowly. And I wanted to kind of expand our, the way we looked at that. And I also thought it would be a good way to give teens who are experiencing the death of one part of their life ways to look at the new part of their life that wasn't quite so terrifying. It's, it's exciting. It's exciting, but it also can be terrifying because there's, it's so many unknowns. It is. And I think it's so interesting because it's like death is very difficult. Like I can't even put words to what death is as an experience. And yeah, it's so, it's something that draws me as a reader and so many other readers. Like, you know, I, I really enjoy going into a book knowing people are going to die. Like, I don't know why. I think it makes it, it, it just makes me feel like more afraid. I like that feeling. I don't know, but there's so many feelings. Why do you think readers are so drawn to death in books? Well, I think it's exactly that because they know they're going into a book that's going to have high stakes and they know if the author is even moderately competent, they're going to feel some emotions around those deaths. And they're hoping to be surprised. I think, but I mean, there's certain ex emotions we expect to feel around literary deaths, like relief or triumph. Like, yeah, I got that sucker or sadness, but we really, I think because we're all like terrified and fascinated by death on some deep cellular level, I think we're all hoping to learn something about that experience or I, I am anyway, but I'm also a big nerd. So who knows? <laughs> oh, I okay. This is, I'm going off script a little bit, but That's as right? you're talking, got to ask this question. So having written a lot of deaths, especially on screen deaths and different deaths and like going into all the ways you can kill people, how, like, I feel like we talk a lot about, like, how have you changed as a writer, but how has your approach to writing death and killing off characters mm. changed since you first, be, like, started writing the His Fair Assassin series? That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say, and I actually would say that it hasn't changed very much. What, what changes is which character I'm writing about. That changes how I approach death hugely, but the way I approach writing death overall hasn't changed um, except from character to character. So the way Ismay approached death was wildly different than the way Sibella approached death. And those were both wildly different than the way Genevieve or Anna appro approaches death. So um, my perspective and the way I approach it weaves throughout their personalities, but overall the, the, the way I want to handle it has remained pretty constant. What about killing off characters? Have you changed your mind and like who you decide to kill off as you've done it and learned like, you know, do you ever go back and we're like, oh, I should have kept them alive longer or oh, I should have killed them or oh, I like, you know. Uh, no, you know, one of the things that was really hard is because so much of the books are are anchored in true and actual history. There were some people I really wanted to kill off, but I couldn't <laughs> because they were they were alive. So I, I couldn't. Oops, sorry. <laughs> My chair just gave up. Um, so I couldn't. I couldn't kill them. And there was a couple that I really wanted to. Um, what was the start of the question again? I got off thinking about the person I really wish I could have killed. I'm sure many of you who've no, read the books. That, have read it. No, <laughs> that's the question deciding like how you decide who to kill and like, I mean, so, you're playing God. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And the thing is I wanted, there had to be deaths that weren't just, that weren't just, not cheap shots, weren't the easy shots. I didn't want to just do the low hanging fruit deaths. There had to be deaths that like, because death doesn't always strike in a convenient way. Um, so I wanted to make sure and, and also I wanted the heroines to have to grapple with that. It's easy to kill somebody who's obviously hideous and deserves to die. What if the orders came to kill somebody who was not? Um, what do you do then? And, and, and what about mercy killing? And so I just wanted to explore all those things. So. There are no deaths that I regret in the books at all, actually. I'm trying to think. Again, there's a couple people I would like to have killed, but I couldn't. Um, 
there were deaths that were really hard to write. There, and there were a number of deaths that I knew were coming like from the minute I started writing because history, the history told me they were coming and I knew they'd be hard on the reader. Um, but to me, those are the most challenging. And I think those are the ones where those more nuanced emotions in the reader come, where, they, where they're surprised. And, and, and I, think, I think they're more memorable. Do you, this might be slightly spoiler, do you have a favorite character you've killed off? And you don't have to say anything for this book, but in right. any of the other. You mean a favorite character that I had to kill off or one that I enjoyed killing the most or? Either one. Okay. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the book, so it's a little tricky. Um, well, but, you don't have to say. It's too spoilery. I oh, can okay. Skip okay. It. Well, it, it doesn't really spoil the plot, but um, um, the Duchess of Brittany, her sister, Isabeau, who's a very young girl in the book, is, is very sick throughout the whole books. And, um, and she, she if, if you Google it, you'll see it. So it's not really a huge surprise. Um, and she dies in the course of the story. And writing her, her death scene was, um, saying this, my favorite death scene sounds kind of warped, but it was such a chance to show what a gift a gentle death could be. And I really love writing a death scene that had so much love in it, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Yeah. That, so. that totally makes sense. And I love how you explore so many different emotions with death. It's just like, oils are spinning right now. You talking? <laughs> um, which now we're going to talk about love a little more. But before we go into that, um, we have another question. Do, 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 I'm curious. No, we didn't get asked. I didn't get a chance to ask you why you think this is such a big theme for YA readers. Like, do you have. Ooh, I think, I mean, I feel like for, I mean, for love, for sure, I think one of the things that's so great about YA is that, well, I think a lot. Okay, I think I'm going to compare it to The Bachelor, because The Bachelor is so entertaining because it's, it's not real life. You're not worried about bills. You're not worried about all these things. And like YA, like falling in love when you're a teenager, even though I feel like our teens that we write about all have a lot of concerns but they don't have so many concerns that you have when you're an adult you know and it's easier just to fall in love with someone and I think those early loves are so powerful yeah. and just so emotional and so I think um I mean for me I I, I do a lot of first loves um and I love that I, yeah. I think it's so fun as an author um and I love reading about it I love I love the characters just falling and not having to worry about other concerns you have to kind of worry about as an adult when you fall in love. Right. Um, and for death, I really don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know why I love reading these books where they're killing off all these characters that I love and why it's so painful. But um, I think everything you said, I think everything you said is so true because I think it kind of, I think it kind of fulfills a need that you have, like, as you're trying to, like, let go of certain parts of your life. But yes. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Although I will say this is interesting. I've heard that there's a, and I don't know if this is true, but it's true for me. I've heard there's a high ratio of YA authors who married their first boyfriend. And so first love. So, like, I, I do, I always write about first loves, too, because to me, they're the most powerful. But that's also who I ended up marrying. So it's... um. So I think that's, um, and I know there's other way, and I guess I can't, I'm trying to where I heard that statistic. I don't know if it was like just somebody, I anyway, I thought that was interesting. I thought, I wonder if that's why we're, we as authors are drawn to that first love experience rather than more adult books where there's like been multiple. Ooh, I love that. I, I think that's not the case, but I love the, <laughs> yeah. I love that you married your first love. Did, is that, he's the boy across the street. <laughs> Oh, we didn't know each other until he until he asked me out on a date. But still, it was pretty funny. Oh my gosh! See, it's like a YA story. It is. It is. He knocked on my door. He, I'd actually had a crush on him for like six months. Um, and I was like watching him, and, and then one day he knocked on my door and like totally freaked me out, and said, "Um, you have a bubble in your tire. Do you need help changing your tire?" Do you know? And I said, 
And my dad had maybe learned how to change tires before he would let me have a car. So I did, but I was no dummy and I was not going to waste a great introduction when it came my way. So I said, no, no, actually I don't. I would love your help. <laughs> and, See, and that's smart because you might have messed up everything. If I know. Because you waiting it six more months to come up with another introduction. I don't have to do that. <laughs> oh my gosh. And Casey Hill just said she married her first love too. So. Oh, okay. There you go. Very interesting. Very this is that theory. Um, okay, so before we get into some of the kissing questions, we have our next question for all of you and the prizes. And I love this question, and I love Robin's answer to it. Um, <laughs> so the next question is: Do you prefer to write um, kissing or killing scene? And so you guys can answer, and we'll pick a winner at the end. So, so again, um, guess which ones Stephanie likes to write, and then guess which ones I like to write, and then we'll. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll give you a minute while I ask this next question, because um, I, I love I love all the romance. Okay, so on to love. Okay, every book in your world has luscious to die for romantic stories. Um, what elements do you think make a timeless love story? I think the, the, the key to a, a great love story is we need to understand why this person is the perfect soulmate for the other. What is it that they see about each other that nobody else sees? What else is it that they get about each other that nobody else gets? Um, if someone has trust issues, how is this one person able to get under their guard and start beginning to gain a little bit of trust? It's all about, I think it, it boils down to finding someone who sees a part of us that we are either afraid of sharing or that we think are afraid no one else sees and learning that they somehow see that. And I think that sets them apart. And I think that is the foundation for, being truly seen, which I think is the key to any really solid relationship. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> and I totally agree. Yeah, I think that's, I think, I think being truly seen is the biggest gift you can give somebody else. See, seeing yeah. and accepting them, obviously. Well, and the vulnerability too. Like, right. I think that shows such a difference in the relationships when it's like this one person that you can be vulnerable with and then they see you and they want you. Yeah. Yeah. And I I'm think also good. I love the answers, by the way, because everyone's just saying you, you love Thank the killing. So <laughs> much. Oh, look at Ava. Ava, Ava got it. Ava got the good one. She got a good answer there. Killing that has emotions. That's actually, that acts. Should, should I give my answer now since that was so, so spot on? Yes. Yes. I think well, you should. Because because I love your answer. So my answer is I like to write killing scenes that feel like kissing scenes, which I know sounds really warped, but um, kind of back to the earlier conversation, I want, especially for assassin nuns in particular, I wouldn't write that for all characters, but for my assassin nuns, the, uh, the killing scenes, I like them to be as intimate and as emotionally fraught as the kissing scene. So sort of a combination thereof. And one of you guys got it. I'm really impressed. Who, who, okay, who got it? Her name was Ava. She was up somewhere. Oh Ava Robin. Her hands was killing. That has emotions. Oh my so gosh! She, I love it. You guys are yeah. okay. You guys, and this is just they so were, fun. That that was really great. How about so? What about you? Which do you prefer, killing or kissing scenes? I told you everybody right. Or are you going to prove them all wrong? <laughs> yeah, I. I totally, I, gosh, you know, it's so, okay, this is so funny because I, I really do enjoy writing the kissing scenes, but the killing scenes are always so much easier for me. Oh, like, really easy, but the kissing scenes are the scenes I love going back to. I love, I love going back to that moment, but more than kissing scenes, actually are my, my favorite are almost kissing scenes. Yes. Yes. Those, that, they get close and then something happens and they back away that like that tease it's the tease yeah because I love those and I think I also love that moment of like those first moments of the physical contact you know where it's first like they have hands brush or the first time like yeah yeah and they have kissed yet and it's like they're close enough to kiss and it's like oh, 
everything feels so intense because they're like feeling out each other. And um, so I love. I you realize it's true. There's almost like an electric current that happens when that, in, in, when, when you get to that in real life. So it's like so great to see that in books. Um, and I, I really feel cute when books don't like really hit those initial stages of intimacy and just jump straight to the kissing because of that first touch, that first nearness, that first almost kiss, they carry just as much impact. Well, and I think that's one of the things I love so much about historical, because I feel you see a lot more in historical of the significance of like brushing things and ankles and wrists and you know, <laughs> all this stuff that now it's like, you know, in a modern story, there's not usually that type of tension related right. with you know, a hand that doesn't have a glove on it. And Unless you're writing enemies to lovers and then that tension is there because they don't want it to be because they're feeling it in spite of what they want to feel. So I think that's one, that's one of the ways, that's one of the reasons I like that trope so much is because it kind of helps put a break on some of the more modern or the lack of modern restrictions to just going straight. That is true. Yeah. Which, yeah, that is so true. I, cause restrictions are awesome um, for writing. Yeah. Stories. And life they're a pain in the neck, but for writing they're awesome. <laughs> They are very true. Okay, so this was a question that Mary wrote, who's not with us, Mary Pearson. We were hoping she could join us, but she had this question for um, Robin because when Mary was agonizing over the heart of betrayal, um, Robin, you told her that writing the last book was the hardest, and according to Mary, you were so right. Um, so was that the case with Igniting Darkness? Yes, it was so hard because... I felt like not only was I wrapping up the duology, but it felt like it was also wrapping up the world. I mean, and there's some people that feel like it was actually, that the books were actually more of a continuation of the original series. And I think there's an argument to be made in either way, I'm, but I wouldn't argue with anybody about that. But I think we, they, it was both wrapping up the duology and then there was also wrapping up sort of the, uh, um, sort of some open questions that were left at the end of the trilogy and, and wanting to do it in a way that would be so satisfying but also having to stay true to what happened historically. That was the hard part was like constantly being like jerked back by the chains of history. Nope, can't do that because historically blah, blah, blah. I was like, no. So I had to really like torturously wind a path to thread a needle, whatever that, whatever cliche you want to use to, to find a way to make it be really satisfying to myself and to readers and the characters, but, but not blow the history thing out of the water too badly. And hopefully I did that. Hopefully. If you could only just have a time machine, then you could just like manipulate history so yeah. it fits. Go back and flick that character out of the way and knock that character down. Get out of there. Uh, so, okay, Sabella, who was the MC in Dark Triumph, which is such an amazing book, um, she returns in this duology as one of the two protagonists. Um, are there any other characters? who might make an appearance in the final installment that we haven't seen. So for people who've been reading along since the beginning, you will be very happy to know that all the main characters from the books do make an appearance in this, in this book, some a couple times and some, yes. So yes, there are many, um, mm -hmm. all the main characters actually make an appearance. That is amazing. I love that. Okay. So some real. And, yeah. Hopefully some in some unexpected ways, but anyway, Oh, I, lo I love it. Like, I'm all for the like full circleness. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Okay. So this is like one of my favorite questions that I have for tonight. Okay. Okay. Real history weaves with fantastical elements in all of these stories. So how did you approach meeting the two? In other words, where the heck did assassin nuns come from? <laughs> oh, this is such a great question. And you know, so many things go into any given idea. It's such a hodgepodge, but about 10 years ago, I was taking this amazing workshop on voice. And it was over a period of six weeks, and we were kind of exploring different parts of our voice and what, it was just such a great class. But at the end of the class, the instructor asked us, asked us, if you could write only one book for the rest of your life, what would it be about? What would it look like? What shape would it take? What subject matter would it involve? What themes would it, you pull in? And I got to thinking about that and I, and I wanted to write this big sort of larger than life, you know, lives and kingdoms hanging in the balance, you know, hard choices and heart twisting agony choices that 
looked like they were going to be tragedy, but just narrowly avert it and come back to happy endings. It was like such a big idea. And I thought, well, I can't do that in middle grade. Um, and I knew I wanted to set it in the middle ages because I'd always been fascinated with them. And it just seemed like the, a, a better backdrop for that kind of story. And as I was researching the middle ages, I came across a few things that really kind of all was, I came across them all in the course of about like two or three weeks and they all just kind of like built on each other. So one of the first things was that women, many um, upper society women in the middle ages preferred joining a convent to the other societal roles because it gave them more personal freedom. And that blew my mind because who thinks of being a nun as being a really personally freeing choice, right? Um, <clears throat> I take my glasses off because they're kind of catching some glare. And then the other thing was that um, that Brittany held on to all of its old ancient customs, much and, and pagan customs, much longer than other um, parts of Western Europe did. And they had this death figure called the Anku, who was, um, and they also had this part of the coast was called the Passage to Death, where there were these night rowers who would get this knock on the door in the middle of the night. And they would go out to their boats and roll these souls across to the island of the dead. Um, that's the third thing. And then the third thing was I had always been fascinated by how um, the Christian church so intentionally co-opted so many of the earlier pagan gods and goddesses and called them saints, trying to get everybody to kind of buy into their religion. And they you know, took over a lot of holy sites and holy wells and built churches on places where old altars had been. And so that all kind of came together in my mind to have these nuns who served. Oh, and there was a final thing was there's an island off the western coast of Brittany that was rumored to be where the last of the nine Celtic Druidesses lived. And they had special powers and could change the weather. And um, and so that all kind of whirled in my mind. And I thought, yes, that's, that's assassin nuns. <laughs> I, okay, I love all of those facts. I also love how, like, you know, in Grave Mercy, you do such a great job of it's like, yes, this is freedom for Ismay. This is, like, the best opportunity. So you you so create that feeling. Um, but I'm just like, I love how you took all these pieces. And then it was just like, of course, this equals assassin nun. <laughs> I know, it's like, it wouldn't for necessarily everybody, but that's how my sort of, like, twisty, turny brain works. Is that how you, like, just in terms of story process, is that how you generally work with stories? Do you come up with, like, have these big key pieces of things that, like, you're kind of really obsessed with and then you just, like, bring them together and tell? It's, or was this unique to this story? No, it's it's kind of, my, I'll get, like, a kernel of an idea and then it's like my brain becomes a magpie and I'll just start all of a sudden all around me, whether in books or on TV shows or just... Like at the grocery store, ideas will start like like just clinging to, or I'll, my brain will start picking up these ideas and saying, "Oh, that would work, or that would work," and all we could pull that in. And I don't even know how they're all going to fit. It's just like starts collecting things like a ad collector, and um, they just kind of stew around in a while. And they eventually, the back of my mind kind of makes these connections, and I go, "Oh, yeah, oh yeah." Or a large part of the time, I will come across some kind of some nugget doing research. research. That's why I love research is because I always stumble across something that's like, oh, that deserves a story. Oh, that deserves a book of its own. Oh, that should be, you know. Um, so, and then sometimes I'll sit down and an idea will, will come to me in a really obvious way. But then when I sit down to work with it, it goes off in 16 different directions that I never expected. So it's it's a pretty sideways process. I, I like hearing that because that's how I feel like mine is. And I know with one story, I'm like in this in the sideways part where I have all the ideas and I know, I know there's a line next to them and I'm just waiting for it to appear. Yeah. So I can relate. I relate to that. Okay. So it's like, a, it's like our, our creative brain leaves us a little trail of breadcrumbs that will lead us to this big idea, but it takes us a while to collect all the breadcrumbs and get there. Yes. And I think it's so hard. So when people ask like, how do you get your ideas? And I always feel like, well, you collect them. And then one day you just have a story. Yeah. And <laughs> Over simplification, but I feel like it's just trusting the process, like trusting, like follow these ideas and play with them and let them sit. And then it comes together magically, which I don't know. That's... Well, magically with 
mixed with a lot of blood and sweat and tears and pulling our hair out and 8,000 drafts. And don't forget that part. <laughs> well, I feel like mine always come after I've been like, no, this isn't working. And then I set it aside and I don't think about it. And then I yes. put something new. And then it's like, ha, ha, ha. You're not thinking about it. So that's, no, that's so true. It's, it's like, and that's why one of the things I hate most about deadlines is there isn't time to set the book aside for a couple of weeks and just let it stew on its own because that's always when the breakthroughs come. Our, yeah. subconscious, our subconsciouses can be so helpful if we just give it a little bit of time. Yes, I, I completely agree. Like, I love the advice, you know, let your book just sit. And, yeah. um, and I think it's hard because there's not always the luxury of doing that, but I think it makes the biggest, biggest difference. Stephen, Stephen King in his book on writing actually talks about the boys in the basement. He said, let the boys in the basement do the heavy lifting. Let the, let the, the, the and he refers to the subconscious, let, let it do its thing. Give it time to do its thing with long walks or putting the manuscript aside for a little while. And I, I found that to be very, very true for me. I think it is. I agree. Okay. So now back to my favorite subject of love and death. <laughs> so I feel as if there are certain things in books that should hit hard when they're present. And I think kissing and killing are two of those things. And they're also two of those things that you are a master of. So I'm asking this question a lot for me because I want to know how you approach these. And if you have any tips for writing high impact kisses and deaths. So there has to be a lot of a lot at stake for the, for the people involved. And, so I mean, like not just killing the bad guys, but the characters have to kill somebody that they care about or they have to kill somebody that they think is a bad guy. And they, as they are having their final conversation, they realize, oh, wow, this person is actually a lot like me. That happened to Ismay um, with one of the characters she was supposed to kill. And as she was doing it, she realized, ooh, there's a lot that's the same in us. And um, so I think is to bring in unexpected emotions that, um, that aren't the obvious ones and I, for, the, for the killing scenes. And, and I think, so it has to, or if it doesn't matter to the character, I think it's okay occasionally to have the character not really care whether they kill that person, but the character has to matter to the reader. So that's the most important thing. The character that's dying has to matter a lot to the reader. So there's a character that Ismay kills at the end of book one that she, well, there's a couple actually that she wasn't really wild about in real life, but as she sees them in death, she realizes that it's tragic that they'll never get to know each other. And so even though it seemed like it would be an easy person for her to kill and she's doing it for a really painful reason. So I think just pulling in non-obvious emotions and having it cost a little bit of the character soul when they do the killing is sort of key. And again, that's why I wrote about assassin nuns, not just assassins, because um, I wanted I wanted to kind of encompass the whole sacred and profane thing. Now, for kissing, I think the same thing holds true. I think it has to high impact kissing scenes mean that when those characters kiss, it costs them something, whether it's their pride, whether it's their sense of self, whether it's their sense of being invulnerable, but it has to break some wall in them or make them look at themselves in some new way um, and pretty much like just alter the way they see the world or themselves or, or the person, I guess, who's doing the kissing. I'm just nodding and like not wanting to write it down, but I really do want to write it all. <laughs> I think I I love I love all of that, especially with the unexpected emotions. Yeah, uh, I feel like you know it's so easy to have just certain emotions. This is what you're supposed to feel, uh, but I don't think life is like that. I feel like you're always feeling things you feel like you're not supposed to feel. Exactly, exactly. And you know, I to give credit where it's due is I learned that technique from Donald Moss and his book Fire and Fiction, which we've talked about. Both of our favorite. Um, craft books. So any of you writers out there, I highly recommend that. Again, Steve, no, not Stephen, um, Donald Moss, um, Fire and Fiction. And he really talks about his micro tension and it's having the unexpected um, emotions sort of underpin the scene. He is my favorite too. And he has an exercise that I love where it's like you write down the 10 emotions your character could be feeling in the scene, like starting with like the most obvious emotion. Right. 
and then you go to like the tenth one, and then you write it using that emotion as yeah. like the guiding emotion, which I always think has such fascinating, fascinating results. It, it bears really interesting fruit. Yeah, it really does. So I'm realizing I just I'm looking at the clock, and I don't do do you, we should probably ask the audience if they not the audience the people out there I don't know participants um, if you guys have questions that you want to we want to make sure and leave questions for you if you have oh I see there's ten so there's plenty of questions okay so I don't know Stephanie oh yeah we have time. Um, and also just a reminder I know we're gonna say it again. Again, at the end, so like I want to say this. So I I have not read Igniting Darkness yet because I've ordered it from Mysterious Galaxy because I was so excited that you can get signed copies, <laughs> which is a real rarity these days when all of us are at home and there are no live events in person. So um, you can and you can still order those signed copies. So that's just true. a reminder, um, shameless reminder. All right, so we love shameless reminders. <laughs> <laughs> the ghostly voice of Mysterious Galaxy comes in. <laughs> I love the um, and, okay. and, okay, here's another special thing I'm not supposed to do, but I'm going to do. If you guys missed the pre-order, um, they sent me a supply of the pre-order buttons. So if you order them today on launch day through Mysterious Galaxy, you can still get them. Don't tell my publisher. We won't tell anyone. Okay. This, but these are gorgeous. I love this. They're so yes. beautiful. Okay. I love this ghostly voice. Okay. So this question is from Shannon Didamore. Um, and she says, Robin, your storytelling voice is so compelling. Hmm. What all do you attribute to that? Any insight there? Story voice is a hard one, and it's the thing I spend the most amount of time on. Um, and and I can't start writing stories until I get the voice right. So that wasn't me, I swear. <laughs> um, my screen like got bigger, so I'm like, what's going on? Um, there's two things that I, I I usually have like two full notebooks before I even start writing a word. And that is I have to know my character's psychological and emotional landscape. What scares her, what thrills her, what her emotional scars and wounds are, whether she thinks the world is a hopeful place or a terrifying one, whether she's got a chip on her shoulder, whether she's trusting, I have to, and I, I can't just understand those things on a theoretical level. I have to know which specific events in her childhood caused her to act that way. Or, or or influenced her in that way. So I, I pretty much like start writing. I often, I have an ex exercise I often do where I think I am seven years old and, and I start doing a free writing and see what comes out. And oftentimes there's a lot, of, a lot of just, my subconscious will just cough up all sorts of interesting stuff that I can kind of weave into a, begin weaving into a backstory. So I really need to know that psychological profile. And, ha and again, not just in general terms, but with specific real details and part of that is also having especially writing historical i need to know the worldview and how it's different from like a contemporary worldview like so if you lived in the 15th century france what are your contexts what are the points of references what type of metaphors or similes would you use that we don't use because that all kind of pulls me into the story world and makes me think in that sort of medieval brain or that full medieval brain because it i'm sure it was wildly different than what i have but it's it gives a sense of being um, that way. So again, two notebooks usually full of answers to those questions and exploring those questions and thinking about, well, did they have siblings and were their siblings kind and how did the village treat them and who would, you know, just, just really um, getting to know them. And, and, then, and then I'll usually write like the first two or three chapters 18 different times um, trying to get that voice just right. And then finally when it clicks, I can move on. It's, it's a little lot tortuous. <laughs> I feel a lot better that you write your first chapters 18 times. It makes me feel very validated right now. I wrote, I wrote 17 drafts of Brave Mercy. Drafts. And you know that's a big book, right? 17 drafts. Yeah. Of the whole book? Of the whole, well, seven drafts were the first half, and then the other 10 were the whole, whole flipping book, yeah. But I did it over okay. kind of about six or seven years. Wow. Okay. I feel a lot better. That is 
that is encouraging to me because I always feel like if I find the secrets of the universe, I can write fast. If you find it, let me know because I have not found it. Whenever I write fast, it comes out. It's just direct. It's like that's I don't do word counts anymore for the same reason because I just get so wrapped up in getting words down on the page. They're really cruddy words. Like none of them are usable. So I just I don't even mess with trying to have a daily word count anymore because it just I get too caught up in the metrics. No, I think that makes sense. My word count, daily word counts are usually like I'll have like a day with 2,000 words. And the next day it's like negative yes. 200, yes. It's negative, negative. And it like, you know, it keeps going. Yeah. It's very, yeah. yeah. It's like glare uh, okay. Next question. And you all can keep asking questions. Um, um, do you want me to, or do you want to pick it, Robin? I, um, I, you, let's see. You're more technically savvy at this than I am, so. Why don't you go ahead and I'll see if I can get caught up on where you are on these. Ooh, this is a great question. This is from Sadie. How do you go about planning an entire series or arc? How do you keep the plot moving and invigorating, especially in books where there are multiple series arcs? Well, I think that's part of what keeps, I think I think that's kind of what gives them their impetus is having lots of different threads and, and things so you can like always, like if there's a, lull in one of the plot threads something's happening in some of the others so it's like and then you kind of weave them all together so there's always there's always a bump in the path but i'm looking at these questions stephanie and there's a lot for you so let's get to some of those miss okay stephanie here's a question for you is it stressful to have so many people want you to write more on the caravel universe oh wow um i didn't see i didn't actually see that one no it is, it's exciting. Um, it's exciting. It's exciting. I feel like, I feel like I'm not supposed to say more, but <laughs> I might be writing Caravel Universe though. <laughs> um, and there, I, I will like officially be able to share, share more this fall for sure. Like we have a date where we're going to talk about um, what I've been working on for the last year and however long so oh, yeah. i'm we all I'm holding our breath until then so it's been yeah i'm really it makes it, it does, it's not stressful i think i feel sad for people so, so here's, a good, here's, like, here's a good question we should probably both answer when writing do you ever feel like what you're writing is totally awful and get discouraged and if so how do you encourage yourself and push through those negative feelings i feel like that might be helpful whoops you're gone where'd you go me? Oh, no. Oh, okay. You're still there. Okay. I just can't see you. Anyway. So yes, I often feel like my writing is direct and I think, how did I ever get published? And the first drafts are, the first drafts are mortifyingly terrible. Um, but I also know that it's just, I, I think you have to get the crappy words out. So the good words can come. It's like you have to write the facile or the easy or the obvious, like, version of something so you can then go in and write the nuance of it um and the way i keep myself from getting discouraged is knowing so many years in my, my first book published in 2003 so what 17 years of doing this and knowing that okay the first draft is always terrible and you always write more drafts and it gets better with each draft but i'm i, I do a lot of drafts i mean like not always 17 but it's rare for me to do less than seven drafts um, so it's just a lot of, and just knowing that's my process. Cause it's pretty, I get so envious of people who can write book, even just in three drafts. It's like, how do you only do the three drafts? Like, it's like, I'm just getting, I'm just getting the, I'm just getting to where I would show it to my editor after the third draft, let alone like to the world. I'm very jealous. I, I, you know what? I never, I don't usually feel bad about my bad words because they're, my first drafts are terrible. Yeah, like, like writing wise and but I'm not worrying about the writing wise I'm trying to get out I'm trying to get the story right yes yes that's what my focus is cause it's like it's for me I'm not I'm trying to think like past the words so I'm just getting the words out as a means to like figure out the story and playing so my first drafts I mean they're really like I they're just like funny bad yeah but, my, they're like it's like 
or, or, or they'll be like they'll be like radio radio scripts. There's no like, there's no bodies. There's just there's just conversation going back and forth. And then I use yeah. That. Yeah, and I actually did that today. I wrote a whole scene like someone suggested yesterday to write it like a screenplay, and so I just did that. Yeah. And then I refined it for the dialogue. Now I'm putting through and adding, but it's like I I'm like Robin, like where I will write, especially like the first half of the book, over and over again. Like I'll write the beginning chapters over and over, and then move on. Um, but it's I feel like once I get the story right, then I can get the words right. But I feel like I can't get the words right until I know. I feel like you have to write the book before you can write the book. Yes, because why well, work on refining words if they're not going to be saying the thing you want to be saying? Yes, yes. So that's how I kind of see it. I'm like, if the words aren't working, it's okay. It's because I don't have the story. And once I know the story and I know the characters, then I then the words are easy to shift because you know what you need to say. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of how I see it. Okay, more questions. Okay. Somebody also asked about how do I go about planning an entire series or arcs? If, if you go to my Instagram feed, I have got so many posts that show these like elaborate sheets of graph paper with multiple like arcs and plot points and, and graphs. And um, it, it'd probably be an easier way for you to see what I do, but there's a lot of literally trying to externalize my internal process so I don't get lost. Ooh, this is a great question from Lamia. And also I agree. I have like all of Robin's Instagram posts bookmarked. Um, are there any books that influenced your career? Oh, wow. There are, and but not in a, it's kind of a sideline way. So there was two different, uh, many years, I blah, blah, blah. I first read um, Outlander when it came out you know, the, um, by Diana Gabaldon. And I remember being so blown away because she did things in book, the book that I didn't think you could do. And I felt that way when I read the first Harry Potter book. They both, as authors, they did things I didn't think you were allowed to do, or they wrote about things I didn't think you were allowed. You weren't allowed to write time travel, and you couldn't do Wizards because they'd been done before. And they did them in their own unique way, and it made me realize no, you can write anything you want to if you bring your own unique take and do it your own way. And so that was really freeing for me. So those two books in particular just made me think, okay, really, it just it doesn't matter if it's been done before if you can bring something new enough to it. I think since, especially now, there's so many books out there, it's easy to think, well, it's, everything's been done, but there's always room for a new take on stuff. This is true, especially with the world changing and for young adult, like, Right. Then uh, so much of our audience is younger. It's like they haven't seen a lot of these books. Right. That and, especially, with itself. and especially, I'm sorry, you kind of break up a little bit. So I start talking, thinking you've stopped. But it's actually just a lag in the video. So I'm not trying to talk over you. Um, I also think, especially because there's so many diverse perspectives that haven't had a chance to tell those stories that will bring fascinating and unique takes to them that we, that will be, we'll all want to see. So I think um, that's just really important. Everybody recognize that there's, just because something's been done doesn't mean it can't be done again and bring your own unique take to it. And we will all gobble it up. I'm sure. So true. Okay. We have five minutes. So we're going to do, we have a lightning round and then yes. a book question for the final. That's right. Prize pack, which um, is a very awesome prize pack and a very awesome. So, yeah. So the prize pack, I don't have a well, should we tell them the prize pack first so they know what they're fighting over, like the Hunger Games? Um, so yeah. I have this massive swag pack of every His Fair Assassin swag ever produced in one big package. And it, so for the, I guess if more than one people get this answer right, we'll have to draw for what. But anyway, that's that's what you're competing for. That is a good price. All right, you want to ask the question? Okay, that means I have to ask it. Uh, did I write it down? <laughs> Or I, why don't you, um, so what character, uh, I'll do it. So what character name appears in both Dark Triumph and Caravelle? Okay, so you guys answer that question. I'm going to do some lightning round questions. 
Um, and so, where, okay, lightning round question. Favorite literary couple? Ooh, um, off the top of my head, I'm gonna say the couple from The Winner's Curse. Yeah, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. my blank on the Kestrel and Aaron, was that? Mm -hmm. Is that their names? I love those books so much. That trilogy is amazing. If you guys haven't read it, I highly recommend it. I bet you Mysterious Galaxy even has some in stock. If not, they could order them. What about yours? What's your favorite I other couple? Mac and Baron. Oh. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Mac right, is like my favorite. my favorite. Yeah, I'm obsessed. Okay, favorite literary death? I don't I. Hmm. I got nothing. Uh, what about you? Maybe if, if you can answer, I'll think real quick. Well, gosh, there's so many great ones. I would have to say, you guys can hate me and think I'm a terrible person. Augustus Waters from The Fault in Our Star. Um, because it was just such a moving, heartbreaking death that left me thinking so so much longer after I read the book. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine killing him off because he's such a great character. So I, I hmm. I have one, but I'm lying a complete blank. I'm really sorry. That's okay. What is your current read? My current read is a historical romance. It's actually an old favorite. I'm kind of super into comfort reads right now. It's it's um, a book by Loretta Chase called Lord of Scoundrels. If you like oh. historical romance and you have not read that one, I highly recommend it. It is like, it is brilliance and perfection. It's so good. I've heard that recommended so many times. I'm gonna have to read it now. Yeah, it's amazing. Who did, was that Mysterious Galaxy? They just said it was so good. Sorry. <laughs> I think, I think. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing oh. book. It's like if I ever wrote an adult romance, that would be the the goal to shoot for that that level. Of, um, brilliance. Awesome. Okay, I I'm reading Midnight Sun. I'm um, loving it. Yeah, I love it. I'm so um, glad to hear that. <laughs> I have like I ordered multiple copies. I'm like that's like my fangirl series. So. Um, I'm really enjoying it. You were excited or nervous about picking it up. I highly recommend it. If you're a fan of the Twilight books, which I think so. Um, and, it is and again, I'm sure the Curious Galaxy has some copies and we'll give you a link here in the comments in just a minute. So, so I think you know, with your other books that you're ordering tonight, pick up a copy of Midnight Sun and do yourself a huge favor. Um, okay, last question current obsession and this can be your favorite song at the moment socks tv show anything that brings you joy or peace right now okay this is going to be so silly but it's so true so my husband put up a hummingbird feeder about three weeks ago and we have so many i mean i don't know why we have like 30 hummingbirds and we have these two hummingbirds. <gasps> every night, it's like a, it's like a hive of bees and every night they swarm these the twilight right, that's they just swarm these feeders and it's it's hilarious watching them zoom for position and then they do they do the you know matrix thing up in the air fighting and then they bite each other and there's bees that get in the way so it's just and it's like it's it's like having two glasses of wine it's so relaxing so they're my they're our obsession right now just go out there and watching the hummingbirds be hummingbirds and it's very grounding and very calming and very zen I love hummingbirds, and I'm gonna have to tell that my critique partner Stacy Lee is always trying to get hummingbirds. Like her goal in life is to get hummingbirds in her backyard, and I have a secret to that. I will give that to her. Okay, you, she will be so happy. Like we have a lot of conversations with hummingbirds. My husband has a special nectar formula that he does that I think attracts them by the like truckload. <laughs> okay, you'll have to share that with me. My current kind of obsession um, is music right now, and um, I am obsessed with the album Dreamland by Glass Animals. It just came out on Friday. Um, I love Glass Animals, and this music, the it's very like soothing. It's oh, very like, makes you think of like an old Hollywood film, kind of like it just makes me think of everything 
filtered in hues of like purple and pink and sunset orange. Um, and so it's just making, I've just been listening to that on repeat and it makes me very happy. Oh, so, very nice. I wrote that down because it sounds really good. I love it. I'm like super obsessed. And okay, that is the end of our question. So we just need to pick one. We have one winner left to pick. Um, there, our, our, our bonus question was not very hard. Like 80,000 people got the answer there. <laughs> you want it? Okay. Uh, I'm having a hard time scrolling through those answers. Yeah, I, I did write down winners for the first few questions. If you want to pick the winner for the third. How do we pick it? We just like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Maybe the first person who answered, that makes it easier. Okay. So um, then that would be oh. Rose. But I Rose. have the Come other one written down. Oh, okay. So I don't have to go. I'll write it. I'll, I'll okay. Write you it. want me to name those? Yeah, okay. so the, the, the big swag pack goes to Rose Kearney. Um, we have them give you their contact information, Mysterious Galaxy Constances. Yes. So, okay, so I will write my email down below in the comments right now. Sorry, I'm like, I'm just a voice craft if this is, but I will write uh, my email down below. So I will expect three emails back from the winners. Email me your, let's see, you guys will need them. Mailing information, yeah. some last name. Yeah, last name so we can mail it and just maybe their email address so we can like reach out and make sure they got it and that kind of thing. But, and for, for me, there's a couple different things they can choose from. So I want to know which one they want. And the other winners for the question number one is Evie Ha. And Yay. then for question number two is Ava. Okay, but you guys, we were the big winners tonight for having all of you show up. Thank you so much for spending your Monday night with us. This was so much fun. And Stephanie, thank you for being such an amazing virtual event partner. I, it was amazing. The enthusiasm is just like a palpable thing. It's great. Uh, Dan, you're gone. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, I don't are you guys know back? Well, now you're showing my whole. Like, I'm here. Okay, <laughs> that was weird. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all very much for coming. You've now seen my horrible, messy spare bedroom office that has not had a chance to have any furniture put in it because of the shutdown. But sorry, technical difficulties on closing and opening tabs. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say um, to Robin, thank you for the amazing exit out. But I just want to reinforce: this has been like such a ridiculously fun event. Oh, good. And I just want to thank you guys so much. Stephanie, you are always a pleasure. Robin, you are always a pleasure. Both of you guys have such amazing energy and are such a treat to get to listen to. So thank you guys so much. And also, major shout out to all the amazing readers and attendees for showing up and all the awesome questions. So I'm alive. Just bought my book to get that pen. So another one more shameless plug. If you want to get the pen, we've got the buy sign book down there. And we will go ahead and say thank you and so much to everyone for coming tonight. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you again.